quite frankly, we hoped that by focusing on his work, we would contribute urgently to people's understanding of his crisis. We are too late. This morning in Nigeria, as we were preparing this profile, Ken Sarawiwa was hanged by the military government. About 12 hours ago, the military regime in Nigeria executed nine men, including environmentalist and minority rights leader Ken Sarawiwa. This heinous act offends our values and darkens our hope for democracy in the region. We particularly deplore this action, for it was taken despite the pleas of so many governments, including my own. My government is now urgently considering what further steps to take, including action by the Security Council. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ken Sarawa never carried gun. He was calling for international attention. He was calling for dialogue. What did they do to him? He was hanged. And every other person who was with him was executed. An excerpt of Sweet Crude, produced by Sandy Siafi, who was on Democracy Now! last week. Uh, Steve Kretzman, um, on the issue of uh, Ken Sarawiwa today, 14 years later, what do you expect to come from this trial? Well, we, we certainly expect uh, justice in terms of greater profile for the issue. But, you know, one thing I really hope comes out of this is the recognition that the struggle that Ken and the Agoni uh, took up 20 years ago um, and, uh, you know, and, and came to a head 14 years ago is really the same struggle, the same issues that are going on in Nigeria today. You had this, uh, the great report last week with Sandy Siofi talking about the ongoing violence in the Niger Delta. The Nigerian parliament just approved on Friday a widening of the offensive against the Nigerian villagers who've taken up arms. And the, you know, the, the causes that they are, uh, that they are, are, are addressing, what they're trying to address here are the same things that Ken and the Agoni and Niger Delta peoples have been trying to address for 40, 50 years. The ongoing uh, flaring of gas, the abject poverty that the region suffers from, despite the fact that billions of dollars of oil wealth have come out of there, the oil spills, et cetera, et cetera. This really has to stop, and we certainly hope that the spotlight of the trial will shine on Nigeria and these issues will finally change this issue once and for all. And Hanshan, what you're doing now, coordinating uh, the outside protests? Well, we're going to be doing a lot of commentary and uh, providing, hopefully, some insight into what's actually happening inside the courtroom. We'll be blogging. We'll be writing about it on shellguilty.com. And tomorrow, to, uh, tomorrow Wednesday at noon in Foley Square, right across from the courthouse, we're holding a rally at, at noon uh, where we'll mark this historic opening of the trial. I mean, uh, for so many people, uh, seeing Ken's prophecy come true that, uh, in fact, Shell would have its day in court is just critically important. And we want to make sure that, that we mark this historic day. So folks in New York and near New York, we hope people will come out for this noontime rally uh, at Foley Square and, and show respects and also show uh, Shell that, that people care about this. And, and as Steve said, this is happening uh, in Nigeria today. There, there are still critical issues that Shell has yet to address. And, uh, you know, we have an opportunity, hopefully, to turn up the heat on Shell a bit right now. Again, I want to say we did invite Shell on today's broadcast. Um, we hope they will join us at a future point. They didn't today. Um, Han Chun, coordinator of the Shell Guilty campaign, that's Shell, shellguilty.com. Uh, Steve Kretzman uh, is executive director of Oil Change International. We're going to go to break, and when we come back, uh, we will turn to another oil giant. They're holding their shareholders meeting this week. We're going to be talking about Chevron. Antonia Juhas is joining us. She's just released a report called The True Cost of Chevron, an alternative annual report. And a spokesperson for Chevron will be joining us, the head of Latin American operations. Stay with us.
Cambodian Poke Plant Life here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting on close to 800 stations around the country, on Pacifica and NPR stations, Low Power FM, college and community radio stations, on public TV stations, uh, public access TV stations, as well as PBS stations, and both TV satellite networks, on Dish Network, Channel 9415, Free Speech TV, 9410 Link TV, and on Direct TV, Channel 375. And we are video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. As we turn now to another oil giant that's operating in the Niger Delta, as well as around the world, Chevron. Well, 10 days into the Nigerian military's offensive in the oil-rich Delta, militants blew up a major Chevron pipeline on Sunday. The movement for the emancipation of Niger Delta, known as MEND, claimed responsibility for the attack. Chevron said it's been forced to shut down about 100,000 barrels a day since the attack. In an email message, MEND said it would continue its, quote, cat and mouse tactics until oil exports cease completely. For Chevron, this is just more bad news ahead of the shareholders' meeting on Wednesday. The attack comes in the midst of fierce court battle in Ecuador over the polluting of the Amazon that could cost Chevron as much as $27 billion. Now Chevron's annual report that uh, 2008 was the company's most profitable year in history. Just ahead of Chevron's shareholder meeting, a new report was released today that is telling shareholders more about the hidden and underreported costs of of these profits. The alternative annual report is called The True Cost of Chevron. It brings together stories from communities across the world, Angola, Burma, Canada, Chad, Cameroon, Ecuador, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, the Philippines, and the United States, all directly affected by and also in struggle against Chevron's operations. Antonia Yuhas is the lead author and editor of the report, available at truecostofchevron.com. She's also author of Tyranny of Oil, the World's Most Powerful Industry and What We Must Do to Stop It. She's joining us from San Francisco. Antonio, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you lay out your findings in this um, uh, true cost of Chevron, the alternative annual report that you've just released today? Yes, thank you, and good morning. Um, the, the most important thing, I think, first to say about the report is that it is a collaborative, unique collaborative effort of local communities all across the United States and the world telling their story of the direct impacts of Chevron's operations on their communities, on their livelihoods, on their health, and an attempt to unite those um, struggles against Chevron into one movement and put it all together in one report to let Chevron shareholders know um, that while the case uh, in Ecuador that is about to cost, it looks like Chevron is going to lose that case, the $27 billion liability, has received um, a significant amount of attention for good reason. It's not an isolated case, and it's not an isolated instance of um, harm caused by the company and communities organizing to ensure that Chevron is held to account. So what we uncovered in the report is essentially a consistent theme across Chevron's operations in the United States and globally of a, a severe lack of adherence to environmental laws and environmental standards, public health laws, public health standards, uh, particularly abroad, rampant human rights abuses, and aligning itself with some of the most brutal governments and supporting those brutal governments and regimes and their militaries in the world. Uh, including uh, using those brutal militaries to protect its uh, operations. Also that Chevron, uh, very much counter to its public uh, relations efforts, um, is very, very much not refashioning itself as a clean energy company, but rather is moving uh, even more aggressively now into some of the most environmentally destructive modes of production that we've come up with, uh, tar sand production in Alberta, uh, shale production in the Midwest, offshore drilling. Chevron also has a coal company. It also has a chemical company. Um, it's also uh, engaging in even more environmentally destructive modes of production while making, uh, at best, token investments in green 